Hi everyone, I'm Dan Fullerton, and today I want to talk about gravity, specifically Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. Our objectives for today are going to be to determine the force that one spherically symmetrical mass exerts on another, to determine the strength of the gravitational field at a specified point outside a spherically symmetrical mass, and finally to describe the gravitational force both inside and outside a uniform sphere, and calculate how the field at the surface depends on the radius and the density of the sphere. So why don't we dive right in? Newton's law of universal gravitation tells us that there is a force of attraction between any two objects that have mass. And it's between, if you take the distance between the center of their masses, that's r, you can calculate that by this constant, capital G, times the mass of the first object in kilograms, times the mass of the second object in kilograms, divided by the square of the distance between the center of their masses. And that's in the direction of each other. So if we happen to have one mass here, one mass there, the force of one and two, the force of one on two pulls it toward it. That's why we have this negative r hat, the direction of the vector between those two. And one feels a force toward two. They're attracted toward each other. Gravity always attracts, it never repels. In this constant, capital G, known as the universal gravitational constant, is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. All right, let's see what we can do with this. Let's find the magnitude of the gravitational force exerted on the Earth by the Sun, given the mass of the Earth, the mass of the Sun, and the distance between them. All right, so our formula for the magnitude of the force between them, force of gravity, is going to be equal to minus g m1 m2 over the square of the distance between them. And that's in the direction of r hat. So for now, I think it's pretty obvious that they're going to be attractive toward each other. So let's just focus on the magnitude. Therefore, the magnitude of the force of gravity is going to be, well, g 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared times our first mass, the mass of the Earth, roughly 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms times the mass of the Sun, significantly bigger, about 2 times 10 to the 30th kilograms divided by the square of the distance between them, roughly 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters squared. A little bit of calculation work, and I should come up with the force of gravity, the gravitational attraction between those, as having a magnitude equal to 3.5 times 10 to the 22nd newtons. And again, that's attractive. The Earth is attracted toward the Sun with that amount of force, and the Sun is attracted to the Earth with that amount of force. Newton's third law. Now, as we talk about these, gravity is a non-contact force, so it's known as a field force. Its effects are observed without the two objects coming into direct contact with each other. That can make things a little bit tricky to understand how they're actually operating. So we've come up with this concept of a gravitational field. And the gravitational field describes what would happen to a mass when it's placed at a particular point in space due to the gravitational force is around it. The strength of the gravitational force on a test object in space we re represent by vectors at the position of the object. So here we have the Earth. If we wanted to represent the gravitational field of the Earth, these arrows show the direction that a mass of the force a mass would feel if it was placed out here around the Earth. And where they're more dense, you would feel a stronger force. Where they're less dense, you would feel a weaker force. So, if the force of gravity is, oops, let me get a different color there, something a little easier to see. If the force of gravity in a constant gravitational field is equal to mg, or by Newton's law of universal gravitation, that's g m1 m2 over r squared, we can cancel out the masses here, our test mass, to say that the gravitational field strength is going to be g times the mass of the object causing the gravitational field divided by the square of the distance from the center of mass to your test object. 
the units of gravitational field strength are going to be newtons per kilogram, which by the way, if you go through the math, is equivalent to the, gra to the uh, unit a meter per second squared, which if you recall, little g we've also used as the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth the acceleration due to gravity if you're assuming you're in a constant gravitational field. So if you were to solve this, calculating the gravitational field strength due to Earth at the surface of the Earth, where the distance from the center of the Earth to the Earth's surface is about 6,378 kilometers, solve that equation with that radius for the Earth. We already talked that, that the mass of the Earth is 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms you're going to come up with the gravitational field strength of 9.81 meters per second squared or 9.81 newtons per kilogram. Same thing. So gravitational field is a way of describing what would happen to a mass when placed in the vicinity of an object that's going to apply a gravitational force to it. Let's take the example of weight on another planet. If you weighed 600 newtons on Earth, what will you weigh on a planet with twice the mass, mass of Earth and half the radius of Earth? Well, to do this, let's go back and look at Newton's law of universal gravitation again. The force of gravity, the magnitude of it, we won't worry about the direction for now, is g m1 m2 over r squared. That's what's known as an inverse square law because of that r squared dependency, that r, 1 over r squared relationship. If the separation between the masses is doubled, for example, the force is going to be quartered. It's an inverse square relationship. So if you weighed 600 newtons on Earth, what will you weigh on a planet with twice the mass of Earth and half the radius of Earth? Well, here's how I would go about doing that. Let's find the gravitational field strength due to this new planet. On Earth, we've got g equals big G times the mass over radius squared Therefore, g on this new planet, p, which is g m over r squared on that new planet, is equal to twice the mass of Earth over half the radius of Earth squared. Half the radius of Earth, twice the mass of Earth. So when I do this, I run through the math here, and I come up with 8 times g mass of Earth over the radius of Earth that's g on Earth. So what we really come up with is the gravitational field strength on the planet is 8 times the gravitational field strength of Earth. So that if mg on this planet must be equal to 8 times mg, or the weight on Earth, or 8 times 600 newtons, you would weigh on this planet, you would have a weight of 600 times 8, or 4,800 Newtons. Wow, pretty heavy. Let's take a look at the gravitational field of a hollow shell. What happens if we have a spherical object, but it's hollow in the middle? Well, inside a hollow sphere, the gravitational field is zero. Outside the hollow sphere, you can treat it as if all of the mass was concentrated at the center of that spherically symmetric object, almost as if it were a dense shell. So you still have the exact same relationship outside the sphere and inside the sphere it's zero. So if we wanted to make a plot of gravitational field strength versus radius, there's gravitational field strength, there's our radius. Inside the object, we would have no gravitational field up here to, let's call this r, the radius of our hollow shell. Outside of that, however, we go right back to our inverse squared law relationship. So we're going to have a graph that looks kind of like this, where g is equal to minus g m over r squared in the direction of the unit vector between that object and your test object. All right, well, what about if it's a solid sphere? If it's a solid sphere, we can treat it, if we're outside the sphere, as if all the mass were contained at the center again, same as with the, so with the uh, hollow sphere. But if we're inside that, that uh, solid sphere, the only mass that counts is the mass that's contained inside the sphere you're drawing. So 
what we would do is if we wanted to see what would happen if we were in some sphere inside there, the only mass that counts is what's inside our sphere if we want to know, for example, what the gravitational field strength is there inside this planet or this object, this sphere. How I would do that is let's call this radius R and that radius capital R. Right away we can define a volume density, let's call that rho, is going to be equal to the total mass of that sphere divided by its volume, or that's mass over the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So that's the total mass of, or the mass density for the entire sphere. Assuming it's uniform, we can find that the volume enclosed by our r by that inner sphere is going to be 4 thirds pi little r cubed. So then the mass that's enclosed by this cube must be equal to the density, the volume density, times the volume. Or that's going to be m over 4 thirds pi r cubed, there's our volume density, times the volume that's enclosed. That's going to be 4 thirds pi r cubed. You can do a couple cancellations here, 4 thirds, we've got a 4 thirds there, we've got a pi up here, a pi up there. All right, when I go through this then, I get that the mass enclosed must be m little r cubed over capital R cubed. Now I can find the gravitational field strength here at that point. To do that then, remember g equals minus g times the mass enclosed now divided by r squared, where that's going to be minus g. Our mass enclosed is capital M r cubed over capital R cubed and we still have our r squared. So some simplifications we can make here. We've got r squared in the denominator. That'll leave us with an r in the numerator. And that capital R is a constant. So I come up with an equation that looks something like minus g times the total mass divided by r cubed, all constants, times r for any radius that's inside the total radius of the sphere. So if I were to graph that one, that would probably look something like this. There's our gravitational field strength. There's our radius inside the sphere. Well, if we're at the exact center, there's no mass enclosed, so that's zero. It's going to grow linearly with the negative, negative value, negative slope, something like that, out until we reach capital R. Now from here, once we're outside capital R, it behaves as if all the mass were concentrated at the center again. Same thing we've been doing. We have our standard one over R squared relationship. So over here, on the left-hand side, inside the sphere, we're proportional to R, or negative R if we wanted to be more specific. Here, we are back to our one over R squared relationship. So gravitational field inside a solid sphere. Hopefully that'll get you started with gravity and Newton's law of universal gravitation. If you need more help or looking for more information, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks and make it a great day.